Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue à cette conférence. Good morning everyone, welcome to this press conference. Today we have with us the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, Minister Tassi, and the Minister of Health, Mr. Jean Duclos. Here for the second time this week, the ministers will begin each with a statement and then we'll move to questions. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to be here with my colleague, the Honorable Philomena Tassi, Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Dr. Tan and Dr. Nu are joining us virtually and will be available to answer questions from the media. Today, I want to update you, we want to update you on the COVID-19 situation and on the Omicron variant at this time. But first, let me turn to my colleague, Minister Tassi, whom I believe has some very good news to share with Canadians. Thank you, Minister Tassi. Good afternoon. Merci. Thank you, uh, Jean-Yves. It's my pleasure to participate in uh, today's announcement. Uh, I acknowledge the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. Our government continues to help all Canadians bring an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. The confirmation of the Omicron variant variant in Canada this week is a stark reminder that what we must remain vigilant in following public health measures, getting vaccination rates as high as possible, and pursuing new tools to help protect Canadians. And my department, Public Services and Procurement Canada, continues to acquire the supplies needed to keep Canadians safe. Given the reinstatement of mandatory testing for certain non-exempt travellers arriving in Canada, my department is working with manufacturers to secure more tests. And I can confirm that our existing contracts provide the flexibility to ensure that any increased demand can be met. Canadians are doing the right things to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and its variants in our communities and our government continues to have their backs. Since Health Canada approved Pfizer pediatric vaccine for those aged 5 to 11, parents and children from across the country have stepped up to do their part. I had the honour of seeing the first shipment come into our country at the John C. Monroe International Airport in my hometown of Hamilton almost two weeks ago. And I am happy to report that 2.9 million pediatric doses have since been received. That's enough to administer a first dose to all eligible children in Canada. And with today's new guidance from NACI on booster shots, I can assure you that our country has access to more than enough vaccine doses for all eligible Canadians. Getting your shot is still the best way to protect yourself and your loved ones and keeping up with public health measures will help to slow the spread of the virus. We also know that access to effective, easy to use treatments is critical to reducing the severity of COVID infections and will help save lives. That is why I am pleased to announce that the Government of Canada has signed an agreement with Pfizer for an initial quantity of 1 million courses of its COVID-19 oral antiviral treatment pending Health Canada authorization. Pfizer initiated a rolling submission for authorization to Health Canada earlier this week. In addition, the Government of Canada has signed an agreement with Merck for an order of up to 500,000 courses of its COVID-19 oral antiviral treatment, Molnupiravir, with options to secure up to 500,000 more pending Health Canada authorization, which Merck is in the process of seeking. I am extremely proud that one of the phase three clinical trials for uh, Molnupiravir has been taking place at Juravinsky Hospital in my hometown of Hamilton. This is another example of how Canadians have been stepping up to combat COVID-19. As soon as these drugs are authorized for use, the government will work on getting them to provinces and territories as quickly as possible so that healthcare providers can help Canadians who need it most. Surges in COVID-19 infections mean challenging times continue for all Canadians. So we must continue 
to follow public health guidelines, and we must keep the vaccination effort going. As Minister of Public Services and Procurement, I will keep working to ensure that we have the supplies Canada needs to finish the fight against COVID-19. And our government will continue to do whatever it takes to keep Canadians safe and healthy. Thank you. Miigwech. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, uh, Philomena. Thank you very much, Philomena. We know that access to effective, easier to administer treatments is essential to reducing the severity of COVID-19 infections and could save lives. So it's with great pride that we announced today that the Government of Canada has signed an agreement with Pfizer for an initial 1 million doses of its new oral antiviral treatment for COVID-19 pending Health Canada approval. Further, the Government of Canada has signed an agree agreement with Merck to obtain up to half a million doses of its oral antiviral treatment for COVID-19, molnupiravir, with options to obtain an additional 500,000 pending Health Canada approval. As soon as these drugs are approved for use, our government will work to get them to the provinces and territories as quickly as possible so that health care providers can help patients who need them. This is great news and another tool in our fight against COVID-19. Let us now turn to the measures we've recently put in place which are intended to mitigate travel-related spread of the Omicron variant in Canada. Let me begin by summarizing the measures announced since last Friday to slow the spread of the Omicron variant in Canada. Last week, we announced that foreign nationals whom, within the last 14 days, have traveled to a list of seven countries will not be permitted entry into Canada. On Tuesday, we added another three countries to the list, and those changes went into force on Wednesday. We have also announced that we are at all fully vaccinated travelers arriving by air who begin their flight journey at any country other than the United States will be subject to arrival testing as well. This last measure is being progressively implemented, but let me be very, be very clear. All travelers should expect to be tested upon arrival and should be ready to isolate. It will take a few days before we are able to test all targeted travelers, but we are ramping up our capacity quickly and testing more and more travelers every day. Je vais maintenant répéter en français. I'll now repeat all of this in French. Last week, we announced that foreign travelers who have spent time in a list of seven countries within 14 days will no longer be allowed to enter Canada. On Tuesday, we added three countries to this list, and these changes went into effect on Wednesday. Canadians who've traveled to one or more of these 10 countries in the last 14 days must now undergo an arrival test in addition to a pre-boarding test and must complete a 14-day quarantine and then take another test on day 8. We've also announced that all air travelers who have begun their journey to Canada from outside the United States will now be required to undergo an arrival test and isolate themselves pending the results of that test. This is all being phased in, but let's be very clear. All travelers must be ready to be tested upon arrival. It'll take a few few days before we're able to test all targeted travelers, but we're already doing more and more tests every day. I said it on Tuesday, and I'll say it again. We won't be able to test all the targeted travelers overnight. It'll take us a few days, but we'll gradually increase the number of travelers tested until the necessary infrastructure is in place to test all the travelers targeted by the announced Measures. I said it on Tuesday, and I will repeat it again today. We will not be able to test every targeted traveler overnight. It will take a few days until the necessary infrastructure, space, and human resources 
are in place. As of December 1st, the government of Canada started an incremental increase in the approach to testing on arrival for fully vaccinated travelers. Testing rates will continue to increase until the infrastructure is in place to test everyone. Officials are working closely with airport authorities, airlines and testing providers, and many other partners to increase capacity at airports, manage traveler flow, and to make sure that the testing protocol is as efficient and quick as possible. In the meantime, I encourage all Canadians to think about how these new rules may impact them and their families and to begin to prepare for when they are fully in place. We have already begun to ramp up testing towards 100% of all travelers coming by air from countries other than the United States. I would also like to remind all travelers, Canadians and foreign nationals, who travel by land, air or water for long or short trips to submit their health and travel information in the free ArriveCan application or website before arriving in Canada. This is mandatory. Foreign national travelers who don't submit their information through ArriveCan may be denied entry into Canada. Canadians who don't submit their information via ArriveCan won't be eligible for exemptions and may face additional delays at the border and be subject to fines. There is much we do not know about this new variant, Omicron. Health Canada is working with manufacturers international regulators and the World Health Organization to assess the potential impact of this variant on the effectiveness of approved test kits, vaccines and treatments. Many questions remain about the Omicron variant, and Health Canada is working with its partners on the WHO to assess the potential impacts of this new variant. What we do know is that the most effective tool we have is vaccination. So, let me repeat, if you have not already done so, please get vaccinated. What we do know is that vaccination remains one of the most effective ways to protect our families, our communities and ourselves against the variants of COVID-19 currently circulating on our planet. In short, if you haven't already, please do get your shot. Earlier today, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization updated its recommendations to provinces and territories on the use of booster doses for people 18 years of age and older. These recommendations from the committee are timely and they'll allow us to move quickly to vaccinate eligible individuals to further protect our families and communities. Thanks to our strong procurement strategy, we will be able to quickly deploy those booster shots and provide an additional degree of protection for Canadians. Now, let me say this again. If you are eligible, please get your booster shot. Encore une fois, je répète, si again, I repeat, if you're eligible, get your booster dose Finally, quickly. Finally, I would like to remind all Canadians that in addition to vaccines, other public health measures continue to be an essential part of our collective fight against the virus in particular in protecting us against community transmission. Wearing our mask, washing our hands, and following public, following public health guidance remain key priorities. Minister Tessi, the doctors and, and myself will now be ready and happy to take your questions. Merveilleux. Uh, thank you. So we'll start a uh, question period with uh, priority to those of us who are in the room. If we do have time, we'll go over to the phones. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, one question, one follow up, and please refrain from, from asking the ministers to auto translate themselves. Uh, we'll start out with, uh, off with Mackenzie Gray, CTV News. Hi, Mr. Duclos. Uh, can you give the medical rationale as to why international flights from all other countries, you have to be tested and there's potential quarantine rules, but for U.S. flights where there are, looks like there's community spread in the U.S. and a number of cases there, the same restrictions don't apply? Well, there will be community spread in the U.S. at some point, but uh, there is none uh, which is of significant magnitude at this time. We are working obviously very closely with our American friends. I've been in contact with them over the last few days. We know that this is a, a, a matter of common interest because of our land border, and we'll follow uh, not only public health advice, but we'll follow up with those uh, uh, discussions and considerations with our U.S. partners. Um, 
There were a number of conversations that uh, have been going on about the land border with the U.S. Uh, and whether or not rules have been applied there in terms of the one-day testing quarantine. Have you had any conversations with your counterparts in the U.S.? And can you declare to Canadians, if they're driving across the border, what the situation would be there? Yes, we've exchanged on that. Uh, uh, two things uh, here. Uh, first, uh, uh, no, we are obviously... Uh, in the ideal world, would like to have common measures that would simplify uh, a lot of things, including the confusion that Canadians can sometimes uh, and naturally feel when it comes to planning uh, and, and having a trip uh, across the uh, American border. The second thing, however, is that we have different countries, different environments, different public health uh, uh, advice and public health uh, institutions. And uh, I think we've been quite successful over the last uh, 20 months in demonstrating that we, we've had a strong set of border measures to protect the health and safety of Canadians. So I believe, and that's what we hear from public health officials, that what we've announced uh, last week on Friday and on Tuesday is currently the best set of measures, given the necessity and the capability with which we are facing when we deal with these issues. Laurence Martin de Radio-Canada, et ensuite ce sera Marika Walsh du Global Mail. You said that for travelers arriving from the U.S., for now, there are no tests upon arrival because right now there's no capacity in Canada to do so. I'm thinking of a Canadian family wanting to go down to the U.S. by plane for the holidays. Can this family expect in a few weeks that when they come back to Canada, they will have to take tests? Because clearly this has implications for going back to work, going back to school, if they have to go into quarantine after they come back to the country. Well, a couple of things can change. First, the measures imposed by the Americans to foreigners entering U.S. territory might be changed. They were changed yesterday, and there might be more changes in future as uh, transmission uh, continues around the world of Omicron. And the second thing that might change are Canadian directives for returning travelers. COVID-19 is still around, and the conditions regarding COVID-19 may evolve. Evolve. Therefore, testing and quarantine uh, directives might also change. In the next few weeks, is it your intent to impose testing for travelers coming back from the states or through the states? Well, we are here to uh, not make people's lives more difficult. COVID-19 is, is making life difficult already. Some people, sometimes for good reasons, for personal reasons, for reasons of compassion, need to travel. So with COVID-19, we want to protect as best as possible people's uh, health and safety, and if we need to impose measures at the border to do that, we will. What about the next few weeks, then? Well, again, our main objective is to uh, keep life livable for families and passengers while protecting the health and safety of people. So, obviously, we don't have a crystal ball. We're just going to see how the situation evolves. Good afternoon, Mr. Can you please clarify if the on-arrival test and isolation that Canada has also applies at the U.S.-Canada border for people who have been in other countries other than the U.S. in the last two weeks? And can you please also clarify if the people who are currently being tested at the airports when they arrive randomly, if they're being told to isolate while they await their test result? Thank you. Uh, the first question, so uh, people coming from outside of the U.S., transiting through the U.S. by an airport and entering into Canada by an airport, those are subject to the same rules as the rules that apply to people flying from elsewhere in the United States into Canada. So this, the same rules for those like traveling from uh, London, Britain, directly to Toronto, as a, uh, the same rules for those as those that go from London, New York Airport, and Toronto Airport. Now, for the uh, for the uh, the application of the uh, the measures, the testing, and the uh, the obligation to to um, to quarantine, those measures are ramping are being ramped up. So it's important for people to expect that they can be tested and that they can be asked to isolate 
uh, and when they receive uh, those tests. And the, as I said, we are ramping up significantly, significantly the capacity. I was just told uh, a moment ago that uh, since Wednesday, uh, we have increased by 60% the uh, capacity, the testing capacity in airports in Canada. So this is fast. We still have a way to go, but we'll get there. Sorry, and on the land border, if you're crossing from the U.S. into Canada at the land border and have been in Costa Rica or Jamaica, do you also need to be tested on arrival and then told to isolate or at the land border? Does that not exist? And when will this fully be in place that all travelers at airports are told to isolate pending a test result? Good. Two, two questions and uh, two answers. First, we are focusing on airports. So we are not uh, increasing testing capacity at the land uh, border, but there is testing capacity at the land border. Two types of testing uh, capacity and operations. First, for those that uh, come into Canada, and there are very few of them now that are not vaccinated. These are uh, tested, all of them, at the, at the land border. And there is a a, 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 a level of mandatory random testing applied at the land border for those that cross from the United States. So there is testing, but no, no intention at this time to move away from our focus on airports. So that's, uh, that's uh, what we are uh, going to, uh, to invest our resources in, because that's what public health officials are uh, recommending. And I forget your second question. Okay, well, you say that it's already happening, but it's very confusing for travelers who still don't really understand what to expect. So what, what is the date that this will fully be in place, no matter where you are flying into in Canada? Well, we've said that from the very start. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, we tried to answer a similar question. So we said that this would be ramping up uh, over time and across the country. Uh, uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, over time, the ramping up is quite fast, now 60% in approximately two days. But the speed varies with airports. There are some airports where we can do that more quickly because there is uh, excess capacity, uh, excess test capacity. There is space at the airport and there are human resources able to assist. Other airports, will, it will take a bit more time. Merci. Uh, on passe à Raymond Filion de TVA. Thank Ensuite, you. Ce sera Mia Rapson de Canadian Press. Raymond Filion, TVA. Bonjour, Monsieur Duclos. Uh, pour poursuivre dans la, la même to idée, follow vous nous dire à along that les, line, les can you tell us where tests are exactly, exactly being carried out? Would oui, that include font, uh, the Montreal Airport? Yes. Mois. In fact, tests are being administered for several les, les months already at Trudeau Airport. No, no, no. I mean since Tuesday for people coming back. Yes, there are tests at Trudeau Airport and some at all the other airports where foreign travelers are coming in. So Trudeau Airport and elsewhere, the testing capacity has increased in some places a lot over the last few days. Now, as things will change, do you have any advice for people who intend to travel? Would you would you go to some beach with your family in the next few weeks? Well, that's a very personal thing. Every person, every family has their own situation. It would be inappropriate for me to judge people's personal choices. However, what I can say is that the situation can change very quickly. A week ago, we did not, did not even know of this Omicron variant. A couple of days ago, we announced measures which have a clear impact on people Alors, arriving at our airports. So we're hoping things will go well. However, things might become more complicated for people over the coming weeks. It's not what we wish for. So the measures we're taking now, I believe, are going to help ensure that things run as smoothly as possible in the coming weeks. Hi, good afternoon. I'm wondering, most provinces have already decided what to do with boosters. They've already started doing it weeks ago. Why, would, why did you feel it was important to ask NASI this week for very fast advice on boosters when most provinces had already made their own decision on it? Well, for two reasons. The first one is that uh, the, um, the international um, views on, on the use of boost boosters, uh, these views have evolved over the last... Uh, while with the last days and weeks, and, uh, and NASI and PHAC in particular are well positioned you know, to, to incorporate these international views 
and to digest them in the context of Canada. And the second thing is that there is a, a significant level of variability, uh, heterogeneity uh, across Canada in the way in which provinces and territories are moving or not moving on the boosters, and that can create confusion. You know, Canadians watch the news and read the newspapers and sometimes don't really know why their province is positioning itself differently from other provinces and territories. So th there is no intention of imposing a, a one-fit-for-all um, uh, set of measures when it comes to boosters across Canada. But I think there is a need, and I would say even a responsibility for NACI at the federal level to help provinces come closer together in, in, in answering the, the questions of Canadians around, around booster shots and eventually having perhaps a, a bit a more armor, uh, greater harmony, greater coherence in how provinces and territories move forward. Canada's banned travel from 10 African countries at this point, but Omicron has actually been found in 38 countries, at least worldwide, according to the World Health Organization today. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests testing rather than travel bans has a bigger impact on preventing the spread of variants. So at what evidence can you show that banning those 10 travel from those 10 countries in particular and no others is actually helping Canadians? Uh, I would... Uh, probably want to turn that uh, very soon to uh, Dr. Tam. I think she, Dr. Tam and Dr. New eloquently and clearly explain why we uh, wanted to have you know, measures targeted to the 10 countries now and another set of measures that are universally uh, useful, that are universally important to uh, delay, not stop, but to delay the, imp the, the importation of the variant into, uh, into Canada. So one set of measures for countries where we know that there is significant uh, community transmission and, and uh, where it might not be uh, documented internally, but we see obvious external signs that this community transmission exists because there is significant level of exportation of uh, variant Om Omicron infected people outside of those countries. And for the other, the other countries, we knew from the start now, yes, it did start in the UK and then in the, in the Netherlands, and then we knew from the start that it would eventually occur in almost all, all countries. So that's why the measures we announced on Tuesday, the, the, the testing and the quarantine measures at, on arrival, we knew that these measures would be the best measures to protect the health and safety from a, more, from a broader, a more universal uh, approach. Uh, Dr. Tam, uh, I may have... Um, cheated and said things that you would have been uh, even better to say, but uh, let me perhaps invite you to step in if you wish. Yes, um, I, I think the minister explained things really well. At the beginning, you have to act fast and then reevaluate what's going on. At the same time as um, I, I also felt that broader approaches are appropriate because you just don't know where this variant is and some countries don't have the capacity to detect it. So I think initially what we looked at was the actual epidemiologic situation as we know it, but also take into account abilities of countries to detect and respond as well. Um, and then the country's vaccination coverage, the numbers of exports that they, the countries have had, in particular those who haven't yet reported their domestic cases. So if they exported without having detected their own cases as yet. But also the positivity rates at our border testing programs was taken into account. I don't think it was any surprise to people that Nigeria was on the list just because um, not only did we detect our initial travelers uh, who are uh, cases from Nigeria, uh, before um, we were able to communicate back to Nigeria that they may have more of uh, more cases on their hands that they haven't yet detected, but also because the positivity rate of the travelers coming in from that country was quite high compared to everyone else. And, and Egypt was essentially in a similar situation, although the test positive rate, rate at the border wasn't quite as high for Egypt. And Malawi also exported to others. 
so, so it's not just the epidemiology, but their ability to detect and respond and our confidence in that uh, their, their case ascertainment within the country. And then the volume of travelers was also important. And so um, it, it's a sort of com composite picture we were trying to do. But let's remind everyone that Canada had not let go of broad-based measures. We um, like many countries, but certainly we had not let go of the pre-departure test for everyone, whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. That is universally applied, doesn't matter which country you come from, We're, and with some exemptions, but they're very small. And then we still had uh, all the testing for the unvaccinated travelers, where you will have a greater chance of being also mandatory random testing on the vaccinated individuals. So those were all actually in place. Now we're just trying to ramp up the uh, testing even more for those who are vaccinated. I think testing can do two things. Um, you know, to, uh, so that's satisfy two objectives. I, I think whatever we're doing is delaying um, the spread, not preventing it altogether. And I think the system that we have already in place is a great surveillance system. And it's not there to catch every case, but it will give us signals to know which other country is at greatest risk to Canada, for example, through that testing. So you're not testing everyone, but enough samples that you can start detecting uh, hidden uh, root chains of transmission. And then, and then that informs your next set of um, uh, measures. But all to say, though, that we do have to re-examine uh, these measures uh, almost every day. I mean, I, I think we need to be flexible. And if the situation changes, we don't think this list is applicable, for example, we need to be prepared to um, scale it um, down or up. Merci. Thank you. Raphael Pirot, QMI. Bonjour, Monsieur Duclos. Uh, Hello, Mr. Duclos. Christmas is approaching. And how uh, okay, many people are allowed to gather indoors depends on the province. In Quebec, moment, it's 10, but there are more cases. So I'm just wondering, what's your message to Canadians before Christmas? Do you favor one approach over another? And would you be comfortable to be indoors with 25 people uh, in Quebec? Well, I'd love to have 25 people from my family at home. I have 35 cousins, no, 45 cousins, 24 aunts and uncles, my parents, of course, two, I have brothers and sisters. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to put a smile on your face here because, Raphael, you put your question with a smile. Um, however, to be serious, the uh, Government of Canada wants to provide Canadians with the best information possible, and it's also looking at international data and turning to its international partners. Data is being constantly exchanged. But as it now stands, everyone agrees that we must be vigilant. Uh, this is not a time for panic. But Omicron has uh, worrying traits, and that's what we're telling the provinces and territories. We know that they will use every information out there to make the best decisions possible for their citizens. Thank you. You were talking about the message you'd like to send to Canadians. Well, what message? would you send to foreigners wanting to visit family in Canada? They have to get tested. Uh, they might go to quarantine for three days. What about the people who welcome these people from abroad? Will they have to isolate for three days? And would, so what do you want to say people from other countries who want to spend the holidays in Canada? Well, I think people coming to Canada will have to look at the measures which are in place and and any additional measures which might be brought in over the coming weeks. Clearly, people plan ahead, but they don't know ahead what measures are coming down the pipe. Um, in the last few days, we have increased our measures at the border when it comes to testing and quarantine. And these measures indeed might change in the coming days or weeks. That's what life with COVID-19 is like.
Good afternoon. Uh, on the question of antivirals or the announcement of antivirals, when vaccines were first introduced, the messaging from the government was that this was the way out of the pandemic. This was the way forward. That seems to have changed somewhat. I'm wondering if antivirals take that on. Are antivirals the, the way out of the pandemic? So thanks for the question. I think that the way to look at antivirals is to complement. It's, it's another tool that we have available in order to fight uh, this fight against COVID-19. So it in no way takes away from the importance of ensuring that we get the vaccinations. Um, but it is an important tool because it will help prevent those that do get infected with COVID-19 um, from having the serious e effects and impacts, which ultimately put strains on hospitals and uh, healthcare providers. So uh, the short answer to that is that this is absolutely to complement vaccines and it's just another tool in the toolbox, but an important one. Thank you. Oh. If, if I can add briefly um, to what uh, Philomena just said, this is a fourth tool that we're adding to the toolbox. The first one was quickly PPE, personal protective equipment, then came test, then came vaccines, and now we have therapeutics. And this morning I had a meeting with Minister Elliott, uh, the health minister in Ontario, and we recognized obviously quickly that there will always be, unfortunately, people that will be infected with COVID-19, and some of them will have severe symptoms. And it's, it's a lot better to avoid these people having to go to a hospital and, and for all sorts of, obviously, personal and, and public health reasons. And that those, that from great news that uh, Philomena shared with us uh, this morning is a very significant step in uh, further enhancing the tools with which we can, with, we can use over the next months, possibly even years, in order to uh, protect both the pe people and the healthcare system. Um, and on the question of, of test, arrival testing at the border, I hear you talk about how you're increasing testing slowly. I'm wondering if there have been any conversations with labs about increasing the ability to process those tests and if you have any goal time for, for turnaround for those tests. How long should Canadians be prepared to wait? Thank you. Uh, yes, we obviously had, have had to work with, uh, with labs uh, of all sorts uh, uh, to be able to ramp up this capacity over the last few days, and we'll need to do that uh, even more as we move to 100% testing for all air travelers into Canada, except those coming from, from the United States. Uh, this being said, we're also in conversation with provinces and territories because they also have uh, not only significant but superior lab capacity uh, in Canada. Uh, that lab capacity have, has increased considerably over the last month, in part because we uh, invested uh, significant federal resources into building provincial and territorial lab capacity. So we are in conversation also with provinces and territories. If at some point, as if we uh, expand our measures to the land border with the United States, if at some point we need to uh, very significantly improve, in, increase the lab, lab capacity in the country. Tom Perry, CBC. Ensuite, Catherine Lévesque de la Presse canadienne. Puis, on va passer au téléphone. Hi, Minister Duclos. Um, I wonder if you could... Uh, what's the biggest obstacle you're facing in trying to get this airport system, the testing system at the airport, up and running? What's the biggest problem you've got to solve to get it, to, to get it going? Well, there, are, there is, uh, as we've mentioned, lab capacity. How to uh, increase by a, a total of 50% the total capacity of... Um, test in Canada over a short period of time that's, that requires using capacity, test capacity, lab capacity that wasn't used by the federal government. The second thing is uh, around, obviously, uh, human resources to, to make, you know, to, to distribute and to swap, to distribute tests and to swap people at, at airports. And the third thing is about f the physical space that is... Uh, uh, necessary for people to be swabbed at airports. There are airports in Canada where there is physical space, free, easily and quickly accessible, but there, is, there are other airports with which we are currently working to help them free up the physical space that is needed when people enter Canada. 
in, in earlier this week about how some travelers might get take home tests. Could you explain how that's going to work? Because I'm not exactly clear how that uh, how that system is going to work. Well, that's already working uh, in in place for some time. So what happens is that people uh, are registered. They are given a test, uh, uh, given information on how to bring that test home and do the, the home test. Uh, they are, uh, in almost all cases, uh, able to connect to a, uh, a web um, application where a nurse or another um, uh, trained person is able to help the person do uh, herself or himself the test. And then that, that sample is sent by, by courier to a lab and then is processed as quickly as possible. Bonjour tout le monde. Bonjour, Monsieur Duclos. Je voulais revenir sur les Hello, everyone. Hello, Mr. Duclos. I'd like to come back to the antiviral medication, which was just announced. Did you uh, talk about this to your colleagues in the provinces? How will the provinces and colleagues and territories administer them? You said this is a tool. Will it be for unvaccinated persons or vaccinated ones? Yes, in fact, Tuesday evening, I spoke with my provincial and territorial counterparts. I wanted to give them a heads up about the announcement made by Philomena today, and that news was very well received by the provinces and ter territories. The reason why this is fantastic news is because there are tests called antiviral tests. They exist now, or rather, uh, not tests, medication treatment, and they're intravenous treatments. So they are administered in hospitals, and it's complicated for the hospital and for patients. We all know how hard it is right now for doctors and nurses in hospital settings. So many of these people who could have received these intravenous treatments could not access them for the reasons I just explained, lack of capacity in hospitals, and also because some people may, may have lived too far from a hospital. So the good news now is that there are new treatments, they're oral. So people will take them orally. There are 10 doses of this treatment, 10 doses taken over five, uh, 10 days, two a day. People can take them at home. And these, uh, this new treatment, and we're still waiting to hear from Health Canada for specific data, but uh, this treatment will drastically reduce the risk of, vac of hospitalization for both vaccinated and unvaccinated people. There are still unvaccinated Canadians, and often they, when they get COVID-19, suffer more than those who have uh, been vaccinated. Thank you. The doctors talked about this earlier. There are 11 Omicron cases in Canada now, so I'm just wondering whether the doctors would uh, can tell us about the breakdown uh, per province about this virus. Dr. New, well, I'll turn to Dr. New or Dr. Uh, Tan uh, to answer that question. Uh, do you have the most recent breakdown of Omicron uh, cases in this country. Dr. New, Dr. New here, what I can tell you so far is that there are 11 declared cases by provinces and territories, so 11 Omicron cases. As far as I know, there's one in British Columbia, three in Alberta, six in Ontario, and one in Quebec. Now, those numbers will constantly be updated because the situation is evolving, the provinces and territories are are following the situation closely, but for now it's 11 cases. Thank you. We like uh, short and sharp answers. Thank you very much. Over to the phone now. Thank you, merci. You may press star one if you have a question. You can press on étoile one. If you have a question, the first question is from Dan Gromet from Global News Edmonton. Please go ahead. Hey, this question is for the health minister, just about uh, the new testing requirements. And I apologize if you've already answered this in some way, but I'm just curious about connecting flights within Canada for people, uh, travelers returning from foreign countries not named the U.S. So as an example, if I'm coming back from Mexico, my point of origin is Calgary, that's assuming where I'd get the test, but I have a connecting flight to Edmonton. Can you just go over, again, where do I get the test? I assume it's Calgary. What kind of test is it, and where are travelers expected to isolate if they have that test 
yet they have a connecting flight to another city or maybe more than one? Thank you for the question. That depends on your vaccination status. If you come uh, into Calgary and uh, you're, uh, you're vaccinated, you're uh, either swabbed or given a test at the Calgary airport, and then you can move on since you are vaccinated. So, and the reason you, uh, that you can move on is that being vaccinated, you are not um, in contradiction with the November 30th requirement to be vaccinated to be uh, flying into in Canada or outside of Canada. If you're not vaccinated and you come into Calgary, you'll still go, obviously, um, uh, and have a, a test on arrival, but then you'll need to, 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 to stop there and wait for your test results. And it's only then that you'll be able to move to a, sway, a safe uh, quarantine, uh, quarantine place. So just to clarify, if you're vaccinated and you carry on to Edmonton, you don't have to isolate when you get back to your final destination, or no, do you? But you need to isolate once you, got, you get to your final destination. Operator, prochaine question. Uh, Thank you, merci. The next question is from Aidan Cox from BBC News. Please go ahead. Hi, I, I, I was actually just going to ask the, the uh, same question here, but um, uh, I guess is, uh, another question I thought of was who pays for these tests? Because I, I know that uh, you know, there's, there's private lab clinics that, that do testing. Is this something that the, the government is going to cover for travelers, or will this be uh, an expense that you have to cover yourself? Well, thank you. Now, there are three types of tests that uh, travelers uh, will want to consider when they think about leaving Canada. So the pre-departure tests out of Canada, because there are some countries, including the United States, that do require uh, pre-departure out of Canada tests before entering into another country. That's paid by the person. The pre-arrival test to come back to Canada, that's also paid by the person. The test on arrival, the day one test on arrival at the airport, that's covered by the federal government. Okay. Um, one other thing, sort of related to the connecting flights question, what's the case if there's a, a layover? Um, so, you know, similar example, if you fly in from a country out, aside from the U.S., and you have to connect in one city before moving on to your final destination. Can you have a layover of, say, one or two days before um, you end up carrying on to your final destination? And if so, what's the process that you have to follow in terms of, you know, just isolating between when you land at that initial Canadian airport and then getting back into the, the airport to carry on to your final destination? Yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, the, the, comp the question is a bit complicated, and if I'm, I prefer not to give a precise answer because uh, there are so many parameters that seem to be taken into account. It's not a, it's not a blame, it's just, a, a, I think, a, a fact that uh, you have in, in, in mind a, an appropriate uh, example which, uh, which uh, might be quite specific to a particular circumstance. Well, I mean, I so lots, there's lots of layovers that happen. I mean, you know, if you have one, if you have to overnight in, let's say, Toronto and then carry on to, um, like, I'm in Fredericton, uh, what's, what's the guidance there? Okay. So I'll ask my team to make sure that you get the, the right answer. They probably will need to, to, to verify with my colleague, our colleague, Minister Gabra, because there are also uh, transportation rules uh, of which we should be also mindful. Thank you. Operator, Thanks. do we have more questions on the phone? Once again, you may press star one if you have a question. Vous appuyez sur étoile 1 si vous avez une question. There are no further questions at this time. N'avons plus les questions pour le moment. Is there time for one last question from the room? Marika, just one question, please. Okay, thank you. Mr. I just wanted to confirm, the airports keep telling us that they are not yet telling passengers to isolate. I understand you're saying that the tests are being ramped up, but where in Canada, what airport 
is any traveler who is fully vaccinated being told to isolate until that negative test? Where is that happening? Because we can't find any examples of it. It's not yet on your website. So where is that actually happening now? Well, the, uh, the requirement to, uh, to isolate or to quarantine upon arrival, that is being handled by the chief public health uh, officer, so Dr. Tam, who is on the screen, that is requiring her to work with border of officers and local public health officers. So the responsibility is shared by both border and PHAC officers. So, and, and yeah, I'll turn to her in a moment. So people should expect that if it's not happening now, yet it will happen. That And they need to listen to the advice and sometimes the requirement that border or PHAC officials will let will share with them. Anything you would like to add? Uh, um, so I th basically the requirement uh, that if you are from it's quite complicated and I think we're gonna have to put up some tools on the website mm. to so that travelers can actually figure this out like we have done in the past with all the border requirements. Uh, and it depends on whether you're from the 10 countries listed and then uh, figuring out whether you're vaccinated or not. So the, the ones who are um, unvaccinated, of course, we all know what happens to them. The ones who are unvaccinated and you're from those uh, 10 countries, uh, you have to isolate um, at that point of entry. Essentially, you're waiting for your day one test. Uh, that isolation can potentially happen at home or at a, a quarantine facility, depending on the assessment of your quarantine plan. So everybody has to have a quarantine plan um, already specified before you come in, whether you're vaccinated or not. That's just broadly speaking applicable to every traveler. So in that circumstance, you already have a quarantine plan. You should definitely have thought about it. And then you get tested. And I think it's, it's an evaluation of your place of quarantine and whether it's a suitable place. And that will be done by the officers on the ground at the airports. And theoretically, it is actually should be happening in all airports where travelers from these countries come from. That concludes this press conference. Thank you very much.